talk about the k-nearest neighbor algorithm, also known as KNN algorithm. The k-nearest neighbor algorithm is a supervised learning algorithm that can be used for both regression and classification problems that predicts new data points based on k-similar records from a data set. Let's see how this works in practice for a binary classification problem to classify a new data point, here represented by a question mark, given some data samples characterized by two features, x1 and x2, of two classes, the blue class and the orange class. As mentioned, with k nearest neighbors, we are looking at the nearest neighbors of these data points to infer its class label. So let's try k equals 3. We're going to calculate the distance from this question mark data point to all the data points in the data sample. And for simplicity, we assume that the features are real valued, and we're going to use Euclidean distance to compute the distances. We then sort the list of all distances and graph the top three. In our case, this three here with the black circles around them. And voting for labels from these nearest neighbors, the three ones, it looks like our new data sample, the question mark data sample, should be labeled as orange. Now, it's very easy to understand the k nearest neighbor working mechanism, and also it's very easy to use it hands on and practice. In particular, with the scikit learn implementation of the k nearest neighbor algorithm from their neighbors module. Note the k nearest neighbor parameters such as the number of neighbors and the distance metric. With the, five, with the default choice, choice for number of neighbors being 5, and the default choice for the metric being Minkowski metric with p equals 2, which is no other than the Euclidean distance. Now, how important are these choices of hyperparameter? Because this is, what our, this is how these uh, parameters of machine learning algorithms are being called. So let's have a look at the uh, k, the, you know, the k from the k nearest neighbor, the title of the uh, algorithm. The number of neighbors, the k, it's a hyperparameter that you need to choose at the time of model building, just like we did when we said, let's try k equals 3. Now, it turns out that different choices of, key, of k might lead to different class predictions, as we see here. When k equals 1, it turns out that the uh, class label of our uh, question mark data point is blue. When k equals 3, just like we saw, it turned out that the predicting class will be orange, whereas when we switch to k equals 5 or k equals 7, we see that the blues dominate the neighbors uh, voting across uh, the neighborhood, so the uh, predicted class will be blue. So you might wonder, what's the best value for k? Now, you can't really say just by looking at your training data sets, so uh, the ideal way to choose the best value of k will be to use a validation set. That is, you uh, ideally will train different k nearest neighbor models with different k values on a training data set and validate those models on a, valida on, on a validation set, picking the k value that gives you the best performance on the validation set. Now, even so, you'd have to start with some values of k, so let's add some comments here. In the case of a small number of neighbors, like for the extreme case k equals 1, the noise in the data will have a higher influence on the result. So to think of the outliers on, or mislabeled data points, leading to more irregular decision boundaries, like in the overfitting models. As k increases, or a large number of neighbors around our question mark data points say, there is a larger sample around our point and the predictions will have a higher statistical confidence, making the model or the decision boundary, therefore, uh, more robust to noise, but at the same time, much smoother, much simpler, or less complex, and therefore, maybe less performant, like presumably what happens with underfitting models. Now, thinking of the other extreme, when k equals the size of the whole data set, right, when the predictions will basically be just the same for every new data point, based on majority vote across the whole data set. So a good rule of thumb is to choose the k value uh, not too high, not too low, but somewhere lower than the training's data size, somewhere around 
square square root of, of that particular size of your dra uh, of your sample. With that being said, though, Kinder's neighbor seems to be more successful handling classification problem problems where each class has many possible prototypes, and therefore the decision boundaries are usually quite irregular. Let's now have a look at distance metric choices for Kenyon's neighbor, as finding the closest similar points seems to be the key to this machine learning algorithm. So finding the closest or similar points means finding the distance between points using distance measures, such as the default Minkowski with p equal to, which is no other than Euclidean distance, which is well suited to handle real value vector spaces, in particular numerical values of similar types like length, height, or width. Whereas the Minkowski metric with p equals 1, which is no other than the Manhattan or the taxicab distance, is better suited for real value features of mixed type like age, length, or salaries, keeping in mind that salaries is usually on a much higher scale than age and length. Depending on other characteristics of the model features, like categorical features in your dataset, other distance measures may be more appropriate, like metric choices intended for binary or integer value spaces, Boolean value vector spaces, or um, to name a few, Hamming, Jacker, or cosine similarities. Now, given two value, binary value vectors, the Hamming distance returns the number of positions where the value patterns are different, which is a more meaningful one than using the Euclidean distance or a Manhattan distance. Also, for a Boolean vectors, if we use Jacquard distance, the one returns the number of shared values divided by the total number of values in both vectors. Also, for high-dimensional data sets, when Euclidean distance is not very useful, and other measures such as cosine similarity more are preferred, preferred, which are less affected by the high dimensions, meaning the angle between two vectors is not uh, highly affected by the uh, size of those two vectors. Speaking of high-dimensional feature space, with too many features, the k nearest neighbor algorithm becomes computationally expensive and difficult to solve. Computationally expensive both in finding the neighbors and storing the entire data set, for example. While there are some fast algorithms out there for finding the nearest neighbor, which can reduce the computational load somehow, the bigger issue with Kenyon's neighbor is that it breaks down when the dimensionality of the features is high. Now, why? In general, in a high dimensional space, most points taken from a random finite set inside a finite volume are far away from each other. As someone once said, a high dimensional space is a lonely space. What we mean by this is that not only are the points increasingly far from the mean on average, they are also increasingly far from each other. If you think of two points that are one unit away from each other in each dimension, each direction, on a line they will be on 1D, they will be like one unit apart. Moving in two-dimensional space, those points are actually square root of two length apart. In a three-dimensional space, there will be square root of three, right? There will be like a, on a cube. The distance between, therefore, grows as the dimension grows to be square root of n, where n is the dimensional number of dimensional space. Another way to looking at this is that higher dimensions, the points on average become farther and farther away from each other from, uh, from the center of the hypersphere and also farther away farther and farther away from each other. They also become, uh, as the dimension grows, the points appear farther from each other with more and more volume filling the space between them. For KNN specifically, the curse of dimensionality refers to the problem of classifying and organizing high dimensional data. In short, the more features we have, the more data points we need in order to fill the space. As the data space seen above moves from one dimensions to two dimensions and finally to three dimensions, the given data fills less and less data space. In order to maintain an accurate representation of the space, 
the data for analysis will also need to grow with maybe exponentially with the size of space, with the dimension of space. In low dimensional spaces, data may seem very similar and close, whereas in higher dimensions, the farther these data points may seem to be. In three dimensional example here, we can see that the points are now far apart, sparse, and in this higher dimensional space, as a result, finding the neighbors becomes a bit harder. So we can imagine as we add more dimensions to the data, it becomes more and more far apart. In other words, we may need more data if we want to avoid sparsity in our data and be able to find neighbors in, I don't know, 100 dimensional space. Typically with k nearest neighbor, we also first rescale the numerical features since it's possible that those numerical features are measured in different units. This unit difference causes distance-based algorithm like Kenius neighbor to not perform optimally, so it's necessary to rescale features that have different units so they have the same scales or the same unit. Let's examine a Kenius model here, Kenius neighbor model here, with k equals 1 for simplicity in an i scale versus scale situation. Considering here two features with two quite different units. Uh, x1 could be age, let's say measured from 1 to 100 years, and x2 could be height measured from 1 to 10 feet. Examining the unscaled future scenario while trying to identify that one nearest neighbor needed for cross assignment for our new data point question mark here, looks like the blue dot is closer. However, when we compute the distance between the new data point and the blue point, the distance phi turns out to be much more than the distance from the new data point to the orange data point, which is 2. And therefore, the orange data point, so to speak, wins, and the class predictions for our new data point is orange. Somehow, this doesn't quite make sense when taking into account the difference in scales or units of the two features considered. For example, the distance between the new data point and the blue point of 5, it's more like a 5% change, a small change in the great scheme, of, in great scheme of things across or along the x1 dimension. Whereas the distance from our new data point to the orange dot of 2, it's more of a deal from the x2 perspective, like a 20% change. According to this observation, the new data point would be much closer with less change to the blue dot instead. This is exactly how things look in the scale scenario. We are bringing both x1 and x2 on the same unit, make the distance 1 d1 equals to 0 0.05 and distance 2 it's 0.2. And therefore, the class prediction for the new data point is blue. As many algorithms are sensitive to features being on different scales, like metric-based algorithms, such k nearest neighbors and k means, or gradient-based algorithms, such linear regression or logistic regression or neural networks, uh, bringing features to the same scale it's a very popular uh, transformer in scikit library, for example. And common choices that we're going to explore next are mean variance standardization and mean max scaling. Let's see how this works in sklearn. So the standard scaler in sklearn is basically scaling values of a numerical feature to be centered around mean 0 and standard deviation 1. Let's see it here in action on a short array. Uh, the array that we present to our standard scalar that we pick up from the preprocess uh, module in sklearn is minus 3.4, 4.5, 50, 24, 3.4, and 1, 6. And the uh, return scaling was minus 0 0.9, minus 0 0.47, 1.98, 0 0.57, minus 0.53, and minus, point, uh, minus 0.63. If you look at these numbers, they are smaller numbers, usually 
uh, between minus one and one or between minus two and two, you know, like the 1.98, so apparently it's like two, almost two uh, standard deviation away from the mean. So it could be that these numbers that are produced by the standard scalar, the numerical values traditionally are between minus three and three, uh, given that, you know, uh, normal distribution, it's, you know, allows 90 something percent of the data to stray plus three standard deviation away from the zero mean. Now the other standard scalar, the min max scalar from uh, scikit-learn, scales values in between zero and one. So it takes the minimum number in a uh, minimum value in your array and assign it to zero, and the maximum number in the array is being reassigned to one. And all the numbers in between are reassigned to basically numbers between zero and one. So let's see it in action here on the same short array that we presented to the standard scalar previously. And no surprise, you see the highest value, which is 50, is being assigned to 1. And the smallest value, which is minus 3.4, is being reassigned to 0 by the transformation according to the x minus x mean divided by the x max minus x mean. The pipeline class in sklearn it's a sequential data transforms with a final estimator at the end, and it prevents data leakage as well. As the name suggests, the pipeline class allows sticking multiple processes into a single scikit-learn estimator. Pipeline class has a fit and predict method, just like any other estimator. Now, the above statements will be more meaningful once we start to implement the pipeline on a simple data set. Here we have X train and Y train and X test for predictions. Now, we are ready to create a pipeline object by providing a list of steps. Our steps are imputing missing values by averages, scaling the, feature, the data features with a min-max scalar, and use the process data to train a k-nearest neighbor with k equals 3. Now, the pipeline is an estimator, so at the fit time, the x train goes through the pipeline it goes through the imputation part and the missing values are imputed with averages per each numerical feature. Then it goes through the min max scalar using the min and the max values per each numerical feature to scale the, the, all the features. And the transform x train is then used to train a k nearest neighbor with k equals 3. At the predict time though, the x test goes through the same pipeline. However, at the imputation, uh, stage, the missing values in the X-train numerical features are imputed with averages as learned from the X-train. Then it goes through the min-max scaling and using the min, min and max values again learned from the X-train to scale the uh, X-test features. And the transform, finally the transform X-test dataset, it's used to make predictions with a train k nearest neighbor model on the X-train. So the pipeline not only keeps processes organized, but also avoids data leakage from, say, test into training. Let's finally see how all works together or in, on our in-cost project dataset to predict the label field. We're going to do a little bit of exploratory data analysis on this dataset. We're going to split the dataset into training and test. We're going to uh, do some numerical feature processing and we're going to train a k-news neighbor classifier and then check the performance of this train classifier on the test set. Let's open the Jupyter Notebook for a walkthrough. 